Welcome to Virtual Humans Lecture 10.1, Humans and Nerf. In this lecture, we're going to see how virtual humans or the appearance of virtual humans can be modeled using like NERF techniques. So before we delve into those methods, we have to understand what NERF is doing and what problem is attempting to um, solve. So NERF stands for um, neural radiance fields, and it it provides a new solution for the problem of novel view synthesis. So the problem is you have a set of static images of a scene, and those are sparse typically, and then you want to um, learn a model such that you can render the scene from any viewpoint in a continuous manner. In classical computer graphics, this has been addressed by attempting to reconstruct the scene using multi-view stereo and then rendering the scene from multiple views. But this is difficult, especially for thin structures and when you have like transparent objects and so on. Another approach is to interpolate different viewpoints, um, but that's um, sometimes tricky to do. And more importantly, these methods require lots of specialized knowledge and they are not so easy to reproduce. So what NERF is doing different is uh, is taking a much more radical approach and is learning the radiance of the scene for every five dimensional point defined as the spatial location X, Y, Z and the viewing direction. So essentially we are memorizing for every single point in the scene and every single possible direction where I could be looking from, it's memorizing like what's the color emitted at that in that direction and location, and also the density of the scene at that point, right? So ideally we want like high density where we have um, actually geometry of the scene and we want like very low density where we do not have um, geometry. One nice property of this is that you can model solid objects, but also like, like, um, like volu volumetric uh, objects as well. So, Essentially, once you have this radiance, what you can do is you can do volume rendering in order to obtain the um, image that we are after. So essentially, like um, the pixel color C at a given pixel location, right, is obtained by integrating um, the following quantity along the ray. So the first thing to notice is that R is a ray that starts at O. And basically like um, T is the scalar that parameterizes the movement along the ray. So it's plus T times the direction along the ray. So this integral goes from Tn, which is the um, near end of the synth and Tf, which is the far end of the scene. And um, we integrate along T, so we move along the ray. And then we integrate the following quantity. Essentially the T, is the transmittance along the ray, which itself is this exponential of this integral, right? Um, then we have sigma, which is the volume density, and essentially is the probability of a ray terminating at an infinitesimal particle location R of t, right? The probability of finishing exactly that location would be zero, so you have to consider like an infinitesimal particle. So the way to interpret this is like this product um, like the integral of this product along the ray should sum up to one. And the transmittance, you could, um, this T of T, basically you could interpret that this is the probability that the ray travels from Tn, this uh, near end, until Tf or until T, right? Um, without hitting any other particle, okay? And so this makes sense because, you know, if I'm hitting some um, particle, along the ray, then, you know, I should take up this color and I should not continue integrating further colors um, because like those will be occluded. So this is basically, this um, equation is encoding two things. One, T of T is the probability that I haven't hit anything until that point T and Sigma of T is ex essentially the probability that, you know, it's here what I'm gonna finish. So, um, so that's how you should interpret this equation. Now we have to integrate this equation and um, we're not gonna derive exactly where, how we go from here to here, but it's one way to numerically integrate 
this um, this equation above. So we have this integral, which is replaced by a summation, and we have the transmittance here, which is approximated with this exponential of sum of sigma i delta j. Here, this delta is like um, when we do when we do numerical integration, is this um, separation between samples, and um, then. This term here, which was sigma of r of t, gets replaced by 1 minus the exponential of minus sigma delta i. Um, and this is like you can check the paper um, where it's explained how this approximates this, um, this integral better. And um, essentially here we have this delta i, which is again the distance between adjacent samples, and we have the color at the location ti. Um, one important thing is that uh, in order to obtain a continuous um, model, uh, like um, what it's done here to approximate the integral is to um, divide the ray into segments and then between each segment, notice this is the segment that goes from this um, interval here until this other, this, this, this interval here. Um, so basically you uniformly sample and um, samples, right, from with a uniform distribution in this segment that we're considering. And like this way, like you get like this continuous, um, this continuous representation, um, which is not depending on the discretization of the, of the, of the numerical integration. All right, so that's how we compute this um, integral. And, um, and notice that we can compute this integral because of course, this um these quantities that depend on the radians ci and sigma i are provided by the mlp at every single location so essentially like um this is the key idea from a five dimensional input position and direction the mlp produces the rgb and the density and then basically when we want to generate an image we will march along the ray and we will keep accumulating these um, radiances um, and this basically will be weighted by this density times the transmittance so that we take into account um, the occlusions. And then basically the the um, the loss will be how similar my rendered pixel is to the actual pixel in the image. Okay, so just to um, repeat, we march camera rays um, to generate um uh, to generate a set of um, pixel colors and then we use um uh we use this integral to generate this pixel which we compare against um the ground truth and then basically we minimize this different discrepancy between the um the ground truth pixel and the generated pixel so this is also illustrated with this really cool um, graphics. So basically, like to generate an image, we march along the ray, we accumulate the radiances using the integral that I've shown, shown before. Um, and essentially here we have that for every single point, we can use the MLP to produce the RGB and the density. And basically, then we integrate in order to produce the final pixel color, which is trained. This radiance field is trained such that um, the images match the training images. And because we have this MLP that varies along x, y, z, and direction, like this changes. Um, um, this this basically produces a continuous model. So, if you tr attempt to to um, learn this naively. Um, there is one problem, and uh, the problem is that when you train this with an MLP, like the results of the scene look blurry. So let's look at this uh, a little bit more in detail. So if you have like um, you go from X, like the location and direction directly to the RGB colors and density, what happens is that um, the results look rather blurry all the time. And this was uh, already appearing in the original um, uh, NERF paper. Basically, this is addressed using like a positional encoding. 
which um, essentially it's addressing this blurriness effect. So in some papers, there's um, some theoretical analysis of why this is happening. Um, basically, the bandwidth of the neural tangent kernel limits the spectrum of the recovered learned function. Um, so what intuitively you can understand that basically um, there's a limit on how much sharpness I can produce at the output if the inputs are very similar to each other. So if we have X, Y, Z and the direction uh, nearby points, if they look very similar, then the output will also be very similar. And then basically you will end up with a blurry image. Um, so one way to address this is to like um, map those points to a higher dimensional space using Fourier features. So basically like you have Fourier features that uh, map this X, Y, Z and direction into a larger um, vector, which basically are like different frequencies um, different wavelengths. And this way you can basically increase the spectrum and be able to produce results at the output that are um, sharper. So notice this is without positional encoding. This is with positional encoding. Again, um, like all these um, results look much sharper. And this is very virtual of changing this, the input space, right? But this is this input is not this uh, mapping is not learned. It's basically based on these Fourier features, and that's something that um, you can do to make these um, models um, more uh, basically sharper. So these are like some other examples where notice that this positional encoding um, indeed um, like produces sharper results. Um, this is another example like the. Uh, when we learn without positional encoding, like the results look rather blurry, um, especially um, when the model is not large. And um, with positional encoding, the results look immediately much sharper. Okay. Okay, good. So, um, so one cool of well, cool thing of nerve. Well, there's many cool things of nerve, but one cool thing is that you essentially um, get also like the geometry of the scene, right? Although it was never directly trained for it, uh, it was only trained to represent the original images. But the network recovers the depth because um, you can recover depth by calculating the expected rate termination. Remember, we have this density, and so we can um, calculate it. Calculate the expected um, rate termination depth using this density and the transmittance. And um, so we see that the, the, the NERF recovers not only a continuous representation of the scene that you can render continuously from different multiple um, camera viewpoints, but also recovers the geometry of the scene. So so NERV was definitely a breakthrough and there's many um, follow-up works addressing some of the limitations. So one limitation is that it's scene specific and um, basically you cannot model dynamic scenes. And if you train NERV on a dynamic scene, of course you will get blurry results because you know the, the, the scene is not static. Um, there is no way of easily controlling the scene. So being able to, for example, like um, move particular objects and, and things like that. Um, and the scene is memorized within the network. Then um, it doesn't generalize to new scenes. It's basically for every scene, you train this MLP and you can generate novel viewpoints of this scene, but it doesn't generalize to new scenes. So this is also even now like a, an open issue. And it's expensive to train. It takes up to um, 10 hours, uh, from 10 hours to a few days to train. And inference is also not real time, especially calculating these integrals is um, expensive. And the surface extracted is not uh, very accurate. And it depends. You always need to threshold um, <clears throat> the density in order to um, obtain this um, surface. And that's typically not very accurate. Okay, so um, let's look at the first limitation, like not being able to model dynamic scenes. So right after NERF, there were some extensions, um, several papers that 
extended nerf to time. And so here the goal is to have a sparse set of views and a sparse set of frames, um, temporal instances of the scene. And like the goal is to be able to render the scene from any viewpoint at any time. So one obvious thing that you might think is like, well, let's just depend one more dimension to the input of nerve and uh, predict the radiance and the density, right? So now we are going to depend on X, Y, Z, the viewing direction and time. Um, that sort of makes sense because, you know, nearby points will basically, by virtue of the parameterization, will have nearby um, um, colors and densities, which makes sense. But um, the problem with this is that it produces um, like rather blurry, blurry results, even using the positional encoding. So one more sensitive thing to do is to leverage this idea of canonical space. And this should not surprise you by now. We've seen this for modeling virtual humans. This is a technique that um, is quite recurrent. Um, so basically the idea is that to model time, what we're going to do is to um, input, we're going to concatenate two networks. One is going to learn a deformation field or a scene flow or something related to a scene flow. And the other one is going to learn this um, color and density. So how does this work? You have like a deformed scene, right? Which um, essentially you want to... Um, like, like learn with nerf and then like while we're like uh, march along the ray for every x y z t right we're gonna map it to a deformation field right a deformation vector delta x delta y which is gonna tell me how this deformed scene maps to a canonical scene and in this case the canonical scene could be the first frame of the sequence so essentially, this is why the ray looks morphed here, because this essentially is deforming the scene, right? Such that, you know, those points in the form scene match with the points in the canonical scene. And once I've morphed this, then I will have another MLP, which is going to be exactly nerf, that is going to map this X plus delta X, Y plus delta Y, Z plus delta Z, the viewing direction, to this RGB and the density. So essentially, you will train this end-to-end -end using um, phi x and phi t, phi t all together in a way that the network is automatically learning um, the deformation field and the neural radiance field. And so this is efficient because it's leveraging the correlations and it's able to learn um, a single canonical field and how this canonical um, field or this canonical like scene should be deformed in order to explain each of the time instances. Now, because we don't have any like uh, more physical constraints like this deformation field might not correspond exactly to scene flow, but it will the network will learn shortcuts such that you know it will pick up the corresponding colors and densities that are necessary to render. The, the given deform scene. All right, and this essentially um, produces results that are much sharper um, than um, exploiting nerf plus time, although nerf plus time is also not that bad, actually. It's uh, better than you would think. Um, uh, but this is like a more like, uh, like closer to, to the physical reality uh, way of modeling. And um, then once you've trained this model, which is called DNERF, like you can change, um, this is the input to the model. Wait a second. Um, so on the on the right, you, you see the closest input time. And on the left, you see the interpolation of these um, time instances. And notice that the model um, like produces a continuous result and here, like on the right, it's shown the closest input view and the closest input time. So it shows that, you know, as a naive nearest neighbor uh, baseline, well, I mean, exactly that that's exactly a, ne a nearest neighbor baseline. And notice that this is not continuous while this dinner model is continuous. And you can also observe like um, the recovered uh, meshes of this um, dynamic scenes 
including uh, the mesh, the depth, and also like the displacement fields, which interestingly are um, quite coherent. Um, that's why they look rather um, smooth. All right, so this was one way of modeling uh, time-dependent deformation and being able to disentangle this time-dependent deformation from the neural rendering network. And um, DNRF is also able to synthesize the shading effects by warping the canonical configuration. For example, we observe how the floor shadows are warped a long time. And um, this, this is uh, exactly, so this can be sh um, seen in these um, examples here. Let's see when this will be played. So let's see if those, oh, those are not animated here. Yeah. So basically like um, you can see how this, um, the points in the shadow, for example, of the red ball map to different regions in the canonical um, space. Right. And this is because the network learns whatever shortcut is necessary. All right, so um, to the issue of not being able to edit um, the NERF representation, um, there's also follow-up works. Um, I'm going to explain one that comes from our group, which is called Control NERF, which allows you to take two different scenes and you know combine them in a single scene um, or, for example, like, you know, replicating um, um, one scene, duplicating objects. For example, this dinosaur has been duplicated here, and you can then, then render this edited scene from multiple viewpoints. Okay, so, um, so the idea is to basically um, decouple the scene representation from the neural rendering network. So this is intuitive, right? Because um, it's a bit, uh, so typically you would like to have like some latent representation, some numbers that encode the scene. And then you would like to have like some, um, some model that takes this latent representation and renders like the scene, right? This would be a, an intuitive decomposition that would allow us to, for example, like learn the rendering network independently from the scene. Right. So for this, we need to disentangle these two things. And this is exactly this idea of control nerve. Essentially, um, you have um, like for every scene, you have like a multi scale or a multi -res resolution representation where at every point you store like some feature, right? Some high dimensional feature that basically will be used by a rendering network to produce the color and radiance. Right? So that's the basic idea. So you have um, like these multi-resolution features for every scene, and then you have like a, a rendering network that is not specific to the scene, but is universal for any scene. And then basically you can train this with multiple scenes because you can train for every scene a different volume, and you can train the same network for all the scenes at once. And this gives you an uh, like a, a, a representation that is closer to these graphics representations that we're used to, for example, like um, like uh, occupancies or meshes. And it would allow us to like, you know, take some pieces of this multi-resolution feature grid and, you know, deform them or crop them and move them around. And we could still be able to render because then we can use this rendering network. So, um, so just some some details. Basically, like this uh, multi-resolution training is uh, trained in a course to find manner, um, and then basically you start training this low-resolution volume until it converges, and then you sample the learned uh, feature volume, and then you train the high resolution until it converges, and this improves the time and it produces like higher quality than if you would not do this. Um, techniques. And this allows you to train like uh, multiple scenes into um, at once. 
And basically there's some, some details, for example, like that you need to consider when you're doing this. And this is that you, it's not efficient to sample um, array from a new scene every time, but it's better to keep, to train every scene for a few iterations so that you don't need to load these um, feature volumes into GPU memory and so on. So there's also like some technical details that you have to, to address. And um, but but the key the key advantage here is that you have like a fixed um, neural rendering network and uh, feature volumes that are specific to the scenes. And given sufficient training scenes, the learned radiance function can be applied to optimize for novel scenes more efficiently. Okay, so this is how you can do. Um, scene compositing, you can basically take the feature volume of one scene, the feature volume of another scene, and then you can basically like um, crop one part of one scene and put it in the other, and then use the same rendering network to produce effects like this one. For example, like you take two scenes, like on the left is just um, these plants, on the right is just this dinosaur, and then you can just crop the part that corresponds to the dinosaur and copy the features um, from this scene to this scene. And then basically you can uh, mix and match and produce um, like combinations of um, scenes. Okay, but even with these tricks that I um, explained before, this is expensive to train. You have these multi-resolution volumes with scale, which scale cubically because you have three dimensions and the inference is not real time. So there was a, a paper last year, which is um, neural graphics. Um, oh, sorry, this is incorrect. Uh, uh, one second, um, which was the paper was called um, Instant NGPs. And the same idea is like, uh, this, the idea is similar to this um, decoupling the rendering network from the feature uh, representing the scene. Um, and um, one second, uh, it's my network. Uh, let me move to the slide to explain this. Yes, so this is the key idea. So, um, so now, like instead of um, keeping this full feature volume in memory, the, the key idea here, which is a very simple idea, but, but very neat one, is to have a hash table that maps like um, these corners of these cuboids encapsulating every point in the scene. Um, you will um, keep a, a hash table that maps these vertices of these um, cuboids to these feature uh, vectors. Um, in a way that now, like this uh, multi-resolution hash encoding, um, it allows you to do fast training and not having to deal with these huge um, feature volumes that I described before. So you have fast query and computation, and um, you have a table size T that controls quality versus the memory requirements. And essentially, you will do linear interpolation of these um, corners of the cuboid, same as what we did for IFNets, if you remember. And um, and um, actually this leads to some, uh, using a, like a tailored CUDA implementation, this leads to significant improvements. You get um, instant um, uh, nerve results, which are trained very quickly, um, as you can see here. Right, so the key idea is to have this um, these feature volumes, but then basically they are the features are hashed with a hash table in order to have like a very efficient implementation. Um, this can be used also for training um, sign distance functions, as you can see here, and so on. Okay, so the conclusion of instant NGPs is that you have like a rendering. Um, you have a task-specific GPU implementation, which is 10 to 100 times faster than a naive um, tensor-based approach. And it's uh, it's five to 10, ten times uh, faster than, um, than, than the than TensorFlow. 
and um yeah and basically it, it, it provides a better trade-off of speed versus quality and it's also task task agnostic all right so um we still have the problem that this to obtain like a mesh of the of nerf we need to basically threshold the density and this is not um not straightforward to do and it produces meshes that are not so high quality and so there's a work that you i um that you can check which is basically combining the benefits of surface rendering and volume rendering and um, essentially for surface rendering you have high quality geometry and a clear surface definition but you need the mask supervision and the texture mapping is blurry and with volume rendering, the surface is approximated um, using this um, thresholding. And the good thing is that you can train directly on the pixel colors and uh, you can produce novel views, which are sharp and high quality. So the idea is to combine the best of both worlds to remove the limitation limitations of each. Uh, so this is the basic idea of this um, Unisurf. Essentially you have here, um, the surface rendering, which requires like intersecting the ray with the surface and finding this occupancy O of the point XS where it's at the threshold. This is the same as what we saw in the neural implicit lecture. And with volume rendering, instead we have this ray marching and this integral along the ray. So the key idea here is to um, progressively make the volume rendering converge to surface rendering. So basically you will consider a small interval where you will integrate along the surface and you will make this interval progressively smaller and smaller, okay? Um, so if we look at the equations, essentially we had this um, integral in volume rendering, which is the transmittance times this, um, this which approximates the, the integral of the density and times the color. And essentially this can be um, written in terms of um, in terms of these alpha terms, like summation of alpha and this product of one minus alpha um, j times c i. Okay. And um, the trick here is that for solid objects, this um, alpha, which is approximated this integral of this density, it basically corresponds to an occupancy field OI at the eighth, eighth uh, sample. So you have here summation of the occupancy I product from J1 until I of one minus occupancy J times CI. And again, the interpretation of this is similar to, to before. Um, um, OI is telling you the probability right of this um, point being occupied and this product here one minus OOJ it tells you the probability that I haven't hit any um, surface point along the ray so it's like um, so that's why you have this um, this product of probability that I terminate here and the probability that I haven't been occluded before and now because we have a solid surface this volume rendering equation turns into this like um, simpler um, equation based on, on occupancies. Um, yeah, so, and then the idea is that because you don't know the surface at the beginning, you basically start doing volume rendering and then you um, consider an interval um, at the surface and then you do volume rendering and then you basically make this interval smaller and smaller until like, um, um, uh, and then like you have like this, um, instead of volume rendering, you have this um, surface rendering. Okay, I don't know all the details about this paper. So if you wanna know more details, you should um, um, look at the paper. I thought this was interesting because it was a combination of this um, surface and volume rendering. Okay, so, um, so the advantage of this is that um, you get sharper um, geometry as, as it can be seen here. All right, so this was a 
rather quick overview of nerve and extensions. Um, there's many, many, many more extensions that uh, I didn't describe and that I definitely don't have time. I would need a full lecture for this, um, but this gives you an idea. And now in the next part of this lecture, we will see how to combine neural readings fields with virtual humans. And we will see how to, um, yeah, to leverage these two components in order to have control over the pose and shape of humans while keeping this like um, high quality rendering properties of nerve. Um, if you're interested, um, I would basically check, uh, if you're interested more in this topic, I would check like some website, there are several that collect like this recent advancements in neural fields, like for example, like here, neuralfields.cs.brown.edu. Okay, thank you. That was all for this. And uh, I'll see you in part two in a bit. Bye-bye.